single one of us are called to leave a legacy. You are not called to live forever, but you're called to leave something that does. The good work. That's what we're talking about, to do a good work and to make a difference. Nehemiah, he leads this miraculous makeover, this renovation project, and he completely transforms his world in 52 days. Wouldn't it be great if we could completely transform our world in just 52 days? He rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem for the glory of God and for the good of his people. And throughout this series, we're going to ask you a reoccurring question. And the question is this, what's broken in your world that needs fixing? In a room this size, I'm guessing there's probably something that weighs on you. Something that keeps you up at night. It might be a need that you've seen. It might be a group of people that you know and they're hurting. It may be something in your family, something in your body. But here's what I have found. The burden that you bear often reveals the calling that you'll embrace. In other words, the thing that tends to just grip you, it will compel you oftentimes to make a difference. But here's the thing, you rarely know on the front end that what you're doing is actually going to make a difference. You just feel burdened and you begin to do the work. When I met Preston, before we got married, he had always talked about having a camp. I never thought about having a camp. Never was on my radar, never was in my big picture but it was in his. And so when we began to talk about it, what I did say was, well, you know, I played basketball in college and many moons ago. And so before we would begin our midnight practice, we would take the team away and we would go on a retreat. And you'd have girls from all over different states, different um, backgrounds, different socioeconomics, different nationalities, and different countries. And all of a sudden we would come together And after this weekend, we would begin to gel. You know what I'm saying? We began to to function as a unit. And so I said, well, if we were going to do that, wouldn't it be great to have a team camp where you could have the summer camp, but then you could also teach kids how to think creatively, how to think outside the box, how to work together as a team and communicate and, and grow in their cognitive skills, their critical thinking, their evaluations. And so when we started AIM Team Camp, When you go out there now, everyone always comments the grass is freshly manicured and low. But when we went out there, it was a bunch of trees and weeds, brush. It was a mess. You couldn't even walk out there. We literally, you had to pry open this old rusty gate and then it was just stuff everywhere. I mean, waist high. And we began the good work. We had no idea that it would look like it does today. We had no idea the impact that it would have. We just saw a need and we said, somebody should do that. And so we began to do the work. We decided through that gentle push slash kick that Pastor Frida can give in only her special way. Her and our children's director, Director Laura Roberts, they just pushed us out to act probably quicker than Preston and I wanted to. We'd probably still be thinking about it right now because we wanted it to be just right. That's kind of how we were. We, our standard was really high and they were like, just get after it. Begin to do the good work. And I bet you there's some of you just like that today. This is where you are in this moment. You see a need There's something that God has stirred on the inside of you. You have a burden. And so I want to give you some context for this series. I want to, if you weren't here last week, that'll catch you up to speed. And if you were here, it'll be a quick review. If you go back in time to the year 587 BC, the evil King Nebuchadnezzar is in power. He leads the Babylonian people and they attack Jerusalem completely destroy the city, the lifestyle, the culture, the values of these Jewish people. The temple is destroyed. The Babylonians, they took them into captivity, which crushed their spirits. It demoralized them beyond any hope. And then you fast forward several decades later, and some of the people who were in captivity are released. So of course, their first thought is, I'm going to go back home. 
we're going to rebuild. So as they go back home, they come up to this devastation and it's beyond what they can even imagine. There's no economic structure, no jobs, no systems, no government, no leadership, no direction. And most of all, there's no hope. How many of you need hope? We all have to have hope that confident expectation in the goodness of our God. So here they come and they begin, they're gonna, we're gonna revitalize our area, but they can't gain any traction. They just hit dead end after dead end and it falls to the wayside. 140 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, there's an ordinary guy named Nehemiah who lives a thousand miles away, because remember, they were all transplanted. And he hears about the plight of his people and his country, and it breaks his heart. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a contractor. He wasn't even verified on Instagram. In other words, he's an ordinary guy, a cupbearer to the king. No formal training, no brilliant strategist. And so, Pastor Preston taught us, as he begins to rebuild that, Nehemiah's heart, it broke when he heard the news. And the first thing he did was he sat down to cry. The second thing he did was he knelt down to pray. 12 different times in the book of Nehemiah, we're gonna see Nehemiah pray to God in heaven. And then the third thing is he stood up to act. He said, somebody's gotta do something and it might as well be me. What do you do when you've gotta do a work and you wanna make a difference. I'm gonna give you four thoughts about it today. They're gonna be very practical. Cookies are on the bottom shelf, so everybody can grab one. And I hope that as you get it, through the power of the Holy Spirit, it will begin to stir on the inside of you so that you can do the work and you can make a difference. And the first thing is this, you've got to seek God faithfully. Seek God faithfully. Again and again and again, we see Nehemiah praying before God. So let me just show you the timeline of this so you can understand. So Nehemiah, he hears the news. His brother comes. He tells him the news about the plight of his people in the month of Kislev. That was, what is Kislev? It would be in our day and age between November and December is Kislev. And so he prays about this burden that God has given him until the month of Nisan, which is four months later. So for four months, He's fasting, he's praying, he's seeking the heart of God, he is bombarding heaven. Why? Because he had a burden. For four months, he's asking God to order his steps. And listen, it's impossible for me to even communicate how big of a deal it is for Nehemiah to go talk to the king. Like, he's a cupbearer, he's a servant. His only job is to take burdens off the king. It's not to talk to the king. It's not to deliver news to the king. Nehemiah is not in the king's presence because he's influential. He's not in the king's presence because he's a brilliant strategist. He's not even there because he has an excellent military background and he could really help us. No, The only reason Nehemiah has access to the king is because he is there to make sure the king stays alive. If there's one person in this setting that is expendable, it's Nehemiah. There were enemies, both foreign, abroad, and local, and they would like to assassinate the king. So they had a person whose full-time job was, anytime food was brought to the king, any type of drink was brought to the king, they had to have somebody who would taste it first to make sure it wasn't poisoned. That's Nehemiah. That's his job. So for him to all of a sudden say, I'm going to go talk to the king, you better be praying for four months. You better be covering this thing in prayer. So that's where we're going to pick up. Nehemiah chapter two is where we'll be today, starting with verse one. And so he describes it this way. He says, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, but notice the king sees it. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. 
So even though he doesn't interact like speaking with the king, the king had noticed his, that he was always had a good attitude. He always seemed to be uplifted. And now he can see that his countenance has fallen. Something is wrong. Jump to verse four. Then the king said to me, what is it that you want? Now, I want you to watch again what Nehemiah says. The king says, what do you want? Nehemiah says, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. Something that I want you to remember about prayer is there is nothing too big for God in prayer. There's nothing too big for God's power. And there's nothing too small for God's heart. He cares about all of it. If you care about it, he cares about it. If it's a burden to you, take it to God in prayer. Pastor Preston said last week, if it's big enough to cry about, it's big enough to pray about. There's nothing too small for God's heart. God, I need you. Would you direct me? Would you lead me? Would you help me? So for four months, Nehemiah faithfully sought after God. And God, here's the thing. Here's the thing, church. If you have a heart for something, if you have a vision for something, there's something that is stirring on the inside of you, pray about it. Cover it in prayer. Saturate it in prayer. Don't just jump into it because you got the next idea. Have you seen those people? It's like they got a new idea every week. It's a new week, new idea. Take the one, let it ruminate on the inside of you. Pray about it. Get the heart of God about it. Listen, if prayer isn't necessary for you to accomplish your vision, you're probably not thinking big enough. I like how Mark Batterson says it. He says, go after a dream that's destined to fail without divine intervention. God plus you is the majority. We serve a God who is well able to do exceedingly abundantly above more than you might ask, think, hope, or imagine through his power at work in each one of you. How do you do the work and you make a difference? Number one, you seek God faithfully. Number two, you define the vision clearly. Define the vision clearly. Now, for most of us, it's not a lack of caring that's the problem. It's a lack of clarity. It's not defining specifically what it is that you are called to do. What is it specifically that God has burdened you with, that God has waken you up? What is the specific? Watch. So the king says, Nehemiah, I can see you're upset. What is it that you want? Now watch Nehemiah, very clear, verse five. He says, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. You see this? One sentence, complete clarity. Nehemiah said, send me, please send me to Judah so I can rebuild the walls. You seek God faithfully. You define the vision clearly. Now, let me tell you what Nehemiah did not do. And this is what we do sometimes. The king says, what do you need? Nehemiah did not say, well, king, there's some things that, that I've been thinking about for some time. You know what I'm saying? Like my, my, my Aunt Martha, she's from down in Jerusalem. You know where my people name her from? And she's got three kids. And one of them's kids' names, his name is Mickey. And so Mickey, he sent me this article about the people who lived down there. And I was reading through it. And I didn't really understand what it meant. But there's a couple big words. And I looked them up in Wikipedia. So now I kind of got an idea what it means. But I'm not really sure. And so I was just thinking that maybe i like to go do a mission trip up there in Jerusalem. See what's going on out there. Because you know what? Kind of honest, I'm tired of pouring your wine because I could die. And I don't think I like it. And you know what? You didn't even send me a Christmas card last year for Christmas, so I don't think you care. And then you posted that thing on social media and you didn't tag me in it. And my mama could see that was my shadow in the back there. She knew that was me, but you didn't even tag it. So I didn't think you care about it. So I'm thinking about making a change. And so I was thinking about going down to Jerusalem, checking out, see what they have to say. And so I don't know. I might, maybe I'll send out some letters to get some people to give me some money. So then I can go down to Jerusalem and they can help me do my dream. I go on a mission trip. I still go do it. But then I was talking and Martha and Mickey, they said, well, you know, you work for the king. You go see the king. So maybe you should go talk to the king and see what the king wants to do. So king, what do you think? <laughs> you're laughing. That's what we do. Somebody's like, hey, you're like, God, God spoke to me. And you're like, what'd they say? And then they do that. 
and you're like, Shh. right? And if you don't know it, you're the person. <laughs> you're like, I don't know that because you're the one. <laughs> when I was in getting my master's, I got it in nonprofit and it was in the school of business. My undergrad is education. Education is all about communication. We talk, make sure everybody understands. In business, it's like a 90 second elevator pitch. They don't wanna hear that mess. What is your 90 second elevator pitch? You're on it. God has a divine encounter. He sets up with somebody and they ask you, what is God speaking to you? If you go into all that rigmarole, you, they're gone. You gotta be clear. For a lot of us, it's not caring that's the problem. It's clarity. And God wants to use you to do a good work. Some of you, you would say, well, I wanna help children. Okay, great. Which ones? Ones that don't have their basic needs met, ones that can't read, ones that have been abused, ones that don't have a home, ones that are in a bad home. One, uh, are they in your city? Are they in your state? Are they in your community? Are they in your school? Are they in around the world? I mean, what is it they need? Is it medical? Is it mental health? Is it physical? Is it educational? Is it spiritual? Like, what is it very specifically that God has called you to do? Because the bottom line is this. If you can't define it, you can't do it. If God is calling you to do it, define it clearly. What is it that you want me to do? And then Nehemiah says, please send me to Judah so I can rebuild the wall. How do you do the work and you make a difference? Number one, you seek God faithfully. And number two, you define the vision clearly. Number three, you make plans carefully. Make plans carefully. See, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Well, I feel like, I, I, I feel like I've been called to preach. Okay, great. So what's your plan? Do you read God's word? Have you covered it in prayer? Are you faithful to do God's word? We don't need another person up here telling people to do stuff that they're not doing themselves. Just throwing that out there. Like, what is it? What is it that God's called you to do? Some of you, you're just wishing, and I wanna encourage you today, make a plan. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to get organized. You're welcome. God is a systematic God. We live in a solar system. There are laws that he's put in place. Gravity works every single day. It's not like today it works and tomorrow I'm like, I would come over, but I just can't stop. The gravity is not working today. No, it always works. There are seven days a week, every single week. It's not four this week and then eight next week. And then we might get back to seven a couple of months from now. No, 365 days a year, every single year. Not 300 this year, 800 next year. It's always the same. God is a systematic God. He is a God of order. You wanna do the work? You wanna make a difference? Make plans carefully. Watch how specific and clear Nehemiah is about his plans. Verse six, still in chapter two. It says, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? Now you'll notice Nehemiah didn't say, I don't know, I'm thinking about, let me go talk to Mickey and I'll get back to you and let you know. He didn't say that. He said, it pleased the king to send me. So I set a time, like on the spot, I got a time. And watch this specific request. He says, and may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. In other words, Nehemiah says, would you give me some protection as I travel through these different territories? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that he will get me timber to make the beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall for the residence that I will occupy. Nehemiah, he asked for protection and he asked for provision. He's very clear. I need protection to travel and I need provision to build. Keep going. And because of the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. 
You want to know why the king granted his request? Because of the four months that he spent covering it in prayer. He'd got the mind of Christ. He knew exactly what his plan was. He knew exactly how it laid out. A lot of us, we get an idea and then we're just running shotgun off. And we haven't waited and allowed the Lord to speak to us. He was led by the Spirit of God. God was directing His words. He was ordering His steps. And He was very clear on what His assignment was. He created a plan. He said, this is how I'm going to accomplish it. Well, Paige, I mean, I want to do a plan, but I just have a hard time because, I mean, I got so many ideas. And and I just want to be sure that I get it right. Can I help you today? A perfect plan doesn't have to be perfect. I would rather have a plan, execute a good plan that has been covered in prayer for four months from now, and then I do it at the end of this prayer time, than for me to jump out and do something I've cooked up all on my own. Take the time to get the right counsel. Well, I talked to my neighbor. Well, that's great. Have you talked to the Lord? Get his insight, get his heart, get his plan. You've got to give it covered in prayer. And once you do that, then you're like, well, I just don't know what to do next. I'm going to tell you what it is. The next step is to do the next right thing. That's it. Well, I just don't know. I'm going to do the next right thing. What is the next right thing that God has for you today? Some of you, it might be to love your kids, to speak encouragement to your kids. Some of you, it might be to stop getting on Facebook and run in your mouth. That's your next good thing to do today. For some of you, it might be to go to work and honor your boss instead of trying to figure out how you can show up late and cut out early. They don't see me. They don't know. They don't matter. Don't matter. matter. Listen, honor them. We honor those who are in positions of above us because we honor God. We do things as unto the Lord, right? Listen, step by step, day by day, faithful obedience. Do the next right thing. Listen, to me, success success is not achieving some great, big, glorious, you know, new thing. You know what it is? Success is being faithful to do the right thing today. What has God called you to do today? And you do that as unto the Lord with all of your might. I want to start a ministry. Great. Do the next right thing. What's the next right thing? Maybe you have a meeting with somebody who's already doing the thing that you feel burdened to do. And when you have a meeting with them, don't go in there acting like you got all these new ideas about how they could do what God's called them to do better. You go in, you listen, you ask questions, you're a sponge. I want it. I feel God's called me to do this. I see you do this. How do you do it? What are three things that you think are great? And what are three things you wish you would have known? And what are three things you should never do again? I want to know those things. Tell me those things. Don't assume, ask questions and then live it out, right? You've got an idea. I want to start a business. Great. Go take an online class. Find a mentor, write a business plan. Listen to a podcast. Well, Paige, I want to get married. Great. Well, you're going to need to go on a date. (laughs) Not with a computer. It's like a person. Well, I'm having a hard time. Listen, take a bath. That's your next right thing. Get a clean shirt. Hey, how about you get off the PS4? How about you get a job? That increases your, your, your chances really high, right? What do you do to do the work and to make a difference? You seek God faithfully. You define the vision clearly. You make plans carefully. And number four, you inspire people passionately. Inspire people passionately. Listen, these first two messages last week with Pastor Preston and this week with me, they're pretty encouraging, you know? Come on, you can do it. You can do the good work. But I got to tell you, next week, I want to warn you, not because I don't want you to come, I want you to come because you're going to really want what Pastor Preston brings us next week because he's going to talk about how do you stand firm in the face of opposition, Because here's what you already know. You begin doing a good work. You start making a difference. You know who comes up out the woodworks. All the haters. Because a hater's going to hate, 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 hate. But I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. I shake it off. I shake it off. Right? You already know they're coming. 
And so you're going to have to learn, how do I stand firm? Because I've covered it in prayer. I'm doing the good work. And so we see in this story, in this chapter two of Nehemiah, what happens is the critics and the haters, they begin to come out and the people get discouraged. They're distracted, they're exhausted. And here's Nehemiah again and again, he's stepping up, reaching deep within him to like inspire the people passionately. When I'm sure in his mind, he's thinking, I don't even know if this is gonna work, but we're gonna do it. And he's doing what he can. Look at verse 17. It says, then I said to him, to them, you see the trouble we're in? Now, listen, I love this because Nehemiah, he's like, he, he is telling them the truth. He's like, you see the trouble we're in? Keeping it real. He's not trying to sweep it under the rug. He's not throwing up sunshine and rainbows everywhere because he knows they already know. You see this? Listen, Preston and I, as, as your leaders, one of the things that we endeavor to do is we're not always going to be right, but we're always going to be real. We got an open door policy. People come talk to us all the time. We're going to tell you why we did it, what I thought God said. If I missed it, man, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me. Let's get back on board and let's keep doing God's kingdom because I don't have time for games. I may not be right. I will not be right, but I'll be real. And that's what Nehemiah does. He's like, listen, you see the trouble we're in? <laughs> Jerusalem lies in ruins its gates have been burned with fire. And he says, come. Who is he telling come? He says, come. Everybody who believes, everybody who doesn't believe, people from our homeland, people of the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And then we will no longer be in disgrace. And then Nehemiah says, and I also told them about the gracious hand of my God, on me. We inspire people passionately. You tell them, not the people in here. Listen, we're not a country club. We're not trying to rah-rah each other up in here. We're taking the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he has done for me. And I'm taking it outside these walls to people that I find that are hurting, that are in need, that they're saying, hey, he has done a good work and he promises what he did for me, he'll do it for you. He is no respecter of persons. God is with us. God is working. And so Nehemiah begins to inspire the people to believe that God is with them. God's in this. God is doing it. He's never left us. He's never forsaken us. Listen, he's given us favor. We're going to be able to do this, inspire people passionately. He says, I told him about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. I like what John Wesley said. Some people have called him the founder of the United Methodist Church. He said, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn. Let that passion burn on the inside of you that what God has done for you, he can do it for them. Listen, come with me. Come and see what the lady at the well, remember? He, she has this conversation with Jesus, this encounter, and she was becoming a disciple of Jesus. Then she becomes a disciple maker. She says, come and see this man who has told me everything about myself. That's what we do because we are disciple makers. Come, come and see what he has done because of the fire that burns passionately on the inside inside of you. I believe the reason that I was placed on the planet was to help you see the potential that God put on the inside of you. To know that you are gifted with purpose, that you were created to make a difference. 40 years ago, there were 36 people who gathered on Mother's Day because of the good work that God had called one man and one woman to do. And they started Liberty Church. 40 years later, we're still here, a house for the harvest, a house of healing, a house of hope, where people from all walks of life, they come in, whether they're broken or they're hurting, and together with your prayers and your faith and your heart and your generosity and your story and the power of God that works together with us, we are co-laborers with God. Together, we are able to bring people the hope of Jesus so that they can know Jesus in a real way, so that they can grow daily in their faith. They can discover their God-given gifts. They can find freedom 
in their lives. They can serve faithfully in his kingdom and walk boldly in their purpose. We're impacting our community with the love of Jesus. We're filling heaven, we're plundering hell with people who need the grace and the hope and the mercy that we only find through the unconditional love of our Jesus Christ. You know somebody who needs hope? Back in COVID, we coined a phrase, a hope dealer. Go be a hope dealer. You should be spreading hope everywhere you go. My job is not to tell everybody everything that they've done wrong. My job is to bring hope. The Bible says in Hebrews that we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. It is steadfast and it is sure. We have a hope in Jesus. It can never be dismayed. The hope that we have, we take it not for us here, but to go outside the doors. Go ahead, Liberty Church. Come on, go show them the unconditional love of Jesus who has changed all of us. Every single one of us have had an encounter with him. And one encounter with God does something that we don't have the power to do ourselves. What is it that breaks your heart? Allow it to compel you to do a work. In 2001, Pastor Frieda, my mom, she was traveling all over the world at that time. She, I mean, Ghana, Nigeria, um, Guatemala, Ecuador, El Salvador. I mean, all over the world, all over the United States. My dad would hang here and she just traveled the world. And she all of a sudden lost function of her body. She couldn't write her name. She couldn't stand. They said that she had a lesion on her brain. And at the time they thought maybe she had picked up a parasite because she traveled internationally so much. So she had to go through all of these treatments. And it was during that time that she prayed to the Lord and she said, God, if you'll heal me, I will devote all of this time and effort and energy that I've given to everyone around the world and I'll invest it in my community. Well, God healed her. And in 2001, she founded a nonprofit organization. Has a thrift shop, food pantry, a low power FM radio station called Operation Refuge. For about 20 years, we have served about 200 families a month. That just, you know, simple, faithful obedience, just doing the next right thing. When she founded this, op- this nonprofit, because it was just an up and coming, the banks wouldn't finance everything. So my mom just signed the papers herself. If it goes belly up, I'll pay the note. In 2020, because of her fantastic stewardship and discipline and all that, they became debt-free. Operation Refuge owes no man nothing. Thrift shop, food pantry, radio station. Well, as you already know, the demographics of our area began changing. And now we serve over 200 families a week. Christine Sweeney is our food pantry director, does a fantastic job, her and her team. We're open four days a week. Yeah. Absolutely. If you're looking for a place to volunteer, she'll take you. I don't know how many you served last week, but it was a lot. One day they had over 70 families, just one day. But you know what? There was something that broke Pastor Frieda's heart 23 years ago. And I believe it was a divine assignment because God knew what he was going to need in 2024. What you care about, the burden that you carry, What if it's not an accident? What if there's actually an eternal encounter on the other side of it? It's an eternal assignment that you've been given. Remember, the burden that you bear often reveals the calling that you'll embrace. Well, I mean, Paige, I'm just ordinary person. You know, I'm not like a pastor and I, I I don't feel qualified. I certainly don't feel prepared. Congratulations, you're exactly the kind of person that God uses. Go talk to anybody that we've done stories about in this house. I promise you they had something that God dropped in their heart, but not one of them was like, yeah, 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 that's me, that's me. They're like, God, do something else. Find somebody else. I'll help them. And God's like, no, no, it's you. You're the one. You're like, no, 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 not me. Yeah, yeah, you're the one. Because he just wants somebody to do the next right thing. How do you... Do the work and make a difference. You seek God faithfully. You define the vision clearly. You make plans carefully. And you inspire people passionately. And then you just step out and do what only you can do as you watch God do more than you ever thought possible. 
through his power at work in you to bring his kingdom to come and his will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would do that in us, that you would continue to do the work, that you would stir up the burden that you placed on the inside of us because of the eternal assignment that's attached to it. I pray today, God, that this word would not just inspire us, but it would equip us to do the good work and to make a difference. For those of you that you know there's something more that you need to do and you're ready to act. You're ready to do the work and to make a difference. I wanna pray for you. If that's you and you're like, Paige, I need prayer because I wanna do the work. Would you just slip your hand up? I see your hands all over the room. I see your hands, I see your hands. Father, I pray for every person that you've given them a burden. You've dropped something on the inside of them. God, that you would direct their steps, that you would order their paths. Whatever it is, God, help them to define the vision clearly. Help them do the next right thing, to use their faith and their passion to inspire others to make a difference so that we could advance your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.